So thank you very much, firstly, for the organizers for having invited me to this conference. Let me begin with a quotation. Every young foreign artist who came to Paris after having acquired Parisian taste, which took about a year, had his con contract, his girlfriend, and his car. This is how Italian-born artist Gino Severini describes in his memoirs the standard steps in the progression of an artist's career in Paris in the 1920s. As we know, Pablo Picasso repeated these steps not just once, but over and over again. He had arrived in Paris in 1900, yet during and after the First World War, Picasso sought to affirm his social as well as artistic identity anew. As a Spanish citizen like Juan Gris, Picasso did not join the French army. However, most of his close friends did, including the painters Georges Braque and André Derain, and the poets Guillaume Apollinaire, André Salmon, and Blaise Andrard. Picasso's art dealer, Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, was overtaken by the war while outside France, and, as a German national, was declared an enemy alien by the French government and was thus unable to return to Paris. Separated from his closest friends, including Braque and Apollinaire, because of found him, himself isolated in Paris. Uh, unable to escape criticism of, for his political disengagement and a need to insert himself into new Christ, uh, circles. This paper examines Picasso's portraiture as genre crucial to addressing the question of Picasso and France during the period of World War I. From 1915 to 1918, Picasso produced a group of portraits in uniform of what has been called his new ingresque style. This gallery of military portraits will be uh, the focus of this paper. The subjects of these pencil draw drawings include Picasso's new dealer, Leon Rosenberg, on the left, the multi-talented poet Jean Cocteau, Picasso's close friend, Guillaume Apollinaire, and the polymath, Ricciotto Canudo. Although all through the war years, Picasso refused to introduce the war directly into his art, can his portraits in uniform, nevertheless, be understood as an elusive form of personal statement about wartime conditions? If so, what sort of stand did Picasso take on the issue of French identity as compared to native-born French painters? How did he respond through his art and figurative strategies to the issue of what could be defined as Frenchness? In the fall of 1915, Picasso painted a life-size Harlequin, now at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. In a letter to Gertrude Stein from December 1915, he wrote, I quote, my life is hell. However, I have made a picture of a Harlequin that, to my way of thinking and to that of many others, is the best thing I've ever done. Mr. Rosenberg has it, end of quote. Art historians consider this painting as an extraordinary document of Picasso's personal and social desolation at the beginning of the Great War. Moreover, the figure of the Harlequin that had featured so prominently in Picasso's work during his Rose period, but had disappeared during the, his early Cubist phase, made now a sudden return with the 1950, 1915 Harlequin. Although the Perugian art market remained stagnant during the first two years of World War I, the French collector Leon Rosenberg purchased the Harlequin the very fall of 1915, directly from the artist's studio. Um, this, uh, this purchase is significant, because like many modern artists, Picasso had mostly cooperated with dealers of German origin before the war and had been active in an international network. Therefore, the beginning of the war put Picasso in a difficult situation. Due to the absence of Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, he was actually facing the war without a dealer. As Michael Fitzgerald noted in Making Modernism, if Picasso's income in 1915 amounted to no more than 20,500 francs, as stated in his personal accounts, 
So the total of 8,500 francs that Rosenberg was to pay him for two paintings, one of which was the Harlequin and three watercolors, was vital in keeping Picasso solvent. Picasso was known for his talent in cultivating social relations. In order to celebrate this new business relationship, he executed a portrait of Leon Rosenberg in full military uniform, depicting him as a dignified Frenchman dressed in an officer's overcoat and holding a capi, which is a French military cap, in gloves in his left hand, while gazing thoughtful into the distance. Yet although Leon Rosenberg played an important role in supporting Cubism in Paris during the war years, his figure and actions have been rather less studied than the role later played of, by his younger brother Paul Rosenberg. Um, at the beginning of World War I, Leon Rosenberg had joined the French Flying Corps as a liaison officer. In May 1916, he transferred to the British Royal Flying Corps as a translator for the French Army. In Picasso's drawing, made in the fall of 1915, Rosenberg is uh, represented in officer's attire. However, no rank badge is visible, either on his coat or on his cap. The cloth badge on the collar carries, though, the regimental number two. In contrast to this, a later uniform portrait of Rosenberg drawn by Jean Messenger, probably around 1924, when Messenger was actively collaborating with Rosenberg's gallery, clearly displays the distinctive color tab worn by interpreters. The head of, a, of an Egyptian pharaoh, as can be verified by referring to the Bulletin Officiel du Ministère de la Guerre that enlists meanings of such tabs. So Picasso's portrait also offers a significant insight also to the artist's studio. Leon Rosenberg is represented posing in front of an assortment of artworks. Frames and canvases are depicted in outline leaning against the wall. On the easel, we recognize the cubist harlequin that Rosenberg had just acquired. In a couple of uh, photographic self-portraits, depicting Picasso in the Rue Cholcher studio during the year 1915-1916, now on view on the Picasso portraits exhibition, the artist is seen posing in front of his own works. The formality of the stance, the formal attire, and the fact that, figure position, uh, that the figure is positioned along the vertical axis of the picture all recall the pose of Rosenberg. That Picasso should present his new dealer in his own studio is rather intriguing, opening up a number of questions about the kind of relationship that initially existed between Picasso and Leon Rosenberg. Already in March 1916, in one of his numerous letters, Rosenberg pitched to Picasso his idea that, I quote, together we will be invincible, end of quote. However, the lexus of war that Rosenberg was using to win the battle that, according to Rosenberg himself, involved not only, the France, not only France, but also Cubism, soon led, among other things, to Picasso's rather disillusionment with his project, uh, with Rosenberg's project, and in 1918, Picasso came to a business arrangement with Leon's brother, Paul Rosenberg. However, late in 1915, with his drawn portrait, Picasso seems to have cemented the moment when Leon Rosenberg became, even for some time only, the de facto new supporter of Parisian Cubism. Before the Harlequin went to Rosenberg, the young right bank poet Jean Pocourteau had the chance to see it in Picasso's studio. At the time, Cocteau, who had joined the Red Cross at the beginning of the war as a civilian, civilian ambulance driver, was obsessed with the idea of having his portrait painted. In a letter from 1916, Cocteau wrote to Picasso, grilling him as to whether the great Harlequin was not perhaps meant to be portrait of Cocteau himself. Cocteau had, in fact, already set as a model, model for artists such as Jacques-Camille Blanche, Leon Baxt, Brooks, and, and at the beginning of the war, he was aiming to sit again, and this time, not for Picasso uh, yet, but for Al Albert Glaze, whom he cooperated with for a propaganda production of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Glaze, however, was soon discharged from the military service and then emigrated to New York, and so neither 
uh, enterprise was ever completed, neither the um, propaganda production nor his portrait. In a letter, um, a letter in the Picasso archives reveals uh, that the very first meeting between Cocteau and Picasso took place in July 1915 with Edgar Varese acting as intermediary. Picasso's biographers report that although Cocteau did not know the painter well, for his second visit to Picasso's studio, Cocteau appeared wearing a Harlequin Queen costume borrowed from the Opéra du Paris under his raincoat. William Rubin indicates that Cocteau left the costume at Picasso's and the latter reused it in 1923 for his portrait of the painter Jacinto Salvador. However, there are no indications that in 1915, Picasso executed a portrait of Cocteau, either as a harlequin, not, nor in uniform. So Cocteau still continued to insist that Picasso, Picasso do this portrait. In September 25, uh, 25th, 1915, he wrote a letter to Picasso saying, I quote, my portrait must be painted soon because I'm going to die, end of quote. His third visit to Picasso on May 1st, 1916, finally lent to a portrait of Cocteau. Not a painting, but a drawing. Not as a harlequin, but a portrait in uniform. Just a few days later, the ambulancier returned then to the battlefront. As mentioned later, uh, earlier, sorry, uh, at the start of the war, Cocteau had joined the Red Cross as a civilian ambulance driver a common course of action taken by numerous people such as uh, Maurice Ravel or René Clair, who sympathized with the ideals of the Allied powers but did not want to participate in an active combat. Although this portrait is usually presented as Cocteau en uniform, Cocteau's clothing looks different from the uniforms worn by other ambulance drivers or crew. This photograph, photograph taken in 1960, uh, this photograph of uh, Cocteau taken in 1916 in front of a casement provides a full-length portrait of Cocteau wearing a way more elegant uniform, um, partly recognizable in Picasso's drawing on the color most, uh, mostly. Um, indeed, this perfectly cut uniform was not a regular uniform at all. It was made for Cocteau sur mesure out of the finest fabrics by remarkable innovator, the leading French couturier Paul Poiret. <laughs> Known for having liberated women from their corsets, Poiret, whose legacy for 20th century fashion has been even compared to that of Picasso for the visual arts, was considered at the beginning of World War I to be solely couturier des femmes. He was, in fact, a one man's institution. And now I quote, I am not commercial, Poiret told to New York Times in 1913. Ladies come to me for a gown as they go to a distinguished painter to get their portraits put on canvas. I'm an artist, not a dressmaker, end of quote. At the beginning of World War I, Poiret closed his fashion house and was assigned to the uh, 119th Infantry Regime, uh, Regiment. Throughout the war, however, he still contrived to retain his identity as Paul Poiret, and made himself his own style, self-styled uniform. In the autumn of 1914, Poiret was officially assigned as assistant to the regimental tailor. Despite feeling somewhat humili humiliated by this new position, the great Poiret tried to make a personal contribution to the French war effort by modernizing the French uniform, official uniform. So Poiret suggested this mo new model and designed um, it, but Poiret's design managed to use less clothes. But in the very end, this new military coat was classified as absolutely unsuitable for the soldier's use. Yet, nevertheless, Poiret dressed en boulancier Cocteau. For Cocteau, who initially sought to be portrayed by Picasso as a harlequin, the question is open whether he considered Picasso's pencil, pencil portrait presenting him in the uniform sur mesure by, uh, by Paul Poiret as belonging to a completely different category, or he considered the harlequin and the uniform as both belonging to the different facets of his social masquerade, a part of his masterful talent for eccentric self-fashioning. 
while both Leon Schwarzenberg and Cocteau were relatively safe from active combat, Apollinaire and Ricciotto Canuto, on the contrary, both volunteered to fight at the front for their adopted country. Both they were wounded and both were distinguished during World War I with a military decoration, the Croix de Guerre, that was created in April 1915. Apollinaire fought as a non-commissioned officer with the 96th Infantry Regiment and received his decoration in June 1916 after suffering serious shrapnel wounds to the head in March 1916. He underwent an operation in Paris one month later. The portrait Picasso made of Apollinaire soon after he had left the Italian hospital in Paris, um, the portrait on the left, shows the poet in uniform and profile, founded at the head. His head of in bandages evokes a crown of laurel leaves in the style of early Renaissance medallions, such as those designed by Pisanello, inspired in turn by Roman co co coins bearing the portraits of rulers. One more portrait of Apollinaire in uniform by Picasso shows the poet seated in the same chair Ambroise Vollard had about a year before for a portrait of the dealer that Picasso had created à la manière anglaise in the summer of 1915. In this portrait, Apollinaire is represented as a self-confident war hero in a military uniform with his regimental number 96 on the color. Uh, on the color. Uh, Picasso seems to have simplified though the uniform how, and eliminating the six buttons normally present on the jacket. When it came to dissemination of Apollinaire's portraits, it is rather paradoxical that Alcohol, Apollinaire's first major collection of poetry that established his reputation as a modern poet, published in 1913, 13, before, the start, before the start of the war, has on its cover a Cubist portrait of the poet by Picasso, whereas his Calligram poem, poem de la paix et de la guerre, the collection of his concrete poetry from 1913 19 to 1916, published in April 1918, is illustrated with a profile portrait of the poet in Picasso's new classic style. We touch here one of the most distinctive aspects of Picasso's wartime portrait drawings, their so-called Angresque style. This style first appeared in January 1915 in another Picasso's graphite drawing, the portrait of his friend Marc Jacob. This work marks Picasso's return to the genre of portraiture, a genre in which he had not worked since 1910. Already by the end of the same month, on January 28, 1915, the writer Beatrice Hastings reported <coughs> the app apparent stylistic changes in Picasso's work in the British literary magazine, The New Age. And here I quote, by the way, Monsieur Picasso is painting a portrait of Monsieur Marc Jacob in a style the mere rumor of which is causing all the little men to begin to say that, of course, Cubism was very well in its way, but was never more than an experiment. The style is rumored to be almost photographic, in any case very simple and severe. I can see nothing, as I have not seen it, but I can testify to the state of soul among the Cubists. I can't imagine that Picasso is really doing that. I hope not." End of quote. Hastings was a persona non grata in Picasso's studio, so she had not seen the Picasso's new work, which is probably why she even didn't know that Jacob's portrait was in the end not a painting, but rather a drawing. Jacob's portrait was made available to the public almost two years later only, when it was published in the Parisian literary journal L'Elan, together with a nat naturalistic pencil drawing. Oh. Well. It's a pity, it's a wrong version of a PowerPoint, so um, try to imagine a Max Jacob on the left and a woman with a child by Gina Severini in his new uh, naturalist style in order to show that not only Picasso, but also from former futurist Gina Severini was doing um, different kind of works. Um, and let me find my vote in the test. So, um, so um, when those two drawings appeared in the literary journal Elan together in the same in the same issue of January um, uh, in the year 1916, um, commentate commentators were surprised by the, these metamorphoses which up till, 
up until then did not represent the public face of either Picasso or of a former futurist, Gino Severini. Like Picasso, Severini had remained in Paris during the war and was linked to Leon Rosenberg. Immediately after the publication of Picasso's a portrait of Jacob in Amadie as Enfants pro-militarist journal L'Elan, an article entitled Les Deux Picasso appeared in the reactionary periodical Le Bonheur Rouge, interrogating who actually was the real Picasso, the undecipherable cubist or this Angre. It is apparent that from the very beginning of 1915, or even from 1914, if we consider the painter and his model now at the Musée Picasso in Paris, Picasso was exploring different ground and attempting a synthesis between cubism and more naturalistic techniques, moving toward what we would call, like to call a classicizing representation. As shown by Uwe Fleckner in his intriguing book on Angre's portraits, entitled Appel und Abstraktion, Angre largely used portrait drawings as souvenirs for expressing especially strong feelings and the artist's personal regard to the person portrayed. Portrait. This purpose also seems to be central to Picasso's portrait, drawing, um, portrait drawings. When making portraits, Picasso worked rather rarely on commission. He had, of course, previously made portraits of dealers when wooing potential supporters. So in 1909 and 10, he also used cubism to reinvent portraiture, making portraits of Clovis Sago, Kahnweiler, Ude, or Vollard. However, in 1915, he portrayed Vollard and Leon Rosenberg not in a cubist uh, manner, but in his new Angresque style. And the circumstance is particularly interesting in the case of Rosenberg, who, with a sort of militaristic fervor, was obsessed with the idea of, the, of becoming the main organ for the promotion of cubism, providing with his writings a, even a disciplined approach to the style that he considered to be a coherent movement. Picasso, however, gave Rosenberg a portrait in his new figurative style. Cocteau, who wanted to be portrayed as a harlequin, finally obtained an Ingresque portrait in uniform. Cocteau quickly understood the potential of this new form of representation to fashion his public person as a poet martyr. As he claimed to the French artist Valentin Gros in May 1916, after his third visit to Picasso, and I quote, this morning, I'm posing in Picasso's studio. He is making me a portrait à la manière Angre, very much suited for a young artist who work, whose work needs to be illustrated after his premature death." End of quote. So indeed, Picasso's engagement of portraiture in the Ingresque style took place during the early years of the pan-European movement of call to order that came about following the First World War. The way in which Picasso from late 1914 turned in some of his works to classicizing representation appears to be complexly intertwined with his personal and political turmoil in Paris during the war. By exploring Picasso's portraits in uniform, this paper examined the way in which Picasso, with his pencil portraits, sought to reaffirm his ties with French society. Among the strategies that he adopted for this purpose, I focused on the role played by the evident recourse to French tradition in the manière angresque. The other strategy I proposed is a subtle staging of the war in these portraits by the recourse to, uh, to uniforms. Is this, double sort of, uh, is this a sort of a double masquerade, as the title of this paper called it? This term is certainly not in, used in a pejorative sense. Instead, it was chosen to evoke the multiple levels of identitarian and stylistic negotiation embedded within these peculiar portrait drawings and the multiple layers of relations that connected Picasso's to his sitters. Thank you.